Well, good morning. We've got a really good group today. Uh, we've got more folks that are logging in. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started since it is 10 o'clock. And I just wanted to welcome everybody to the, the webinar here on navigating the future. Uh, we'll be exploring Gen I or Gen AI and mitigating risk for technology leaders. So my name is Emily Hemingway. I'm the executive director of Tech STL. We are proud to serve as the first tech council here in St. Louis. And I'm thrilled to be moderating today. So this is my second time working with Agile Computing on moderating their AI series. Uh, really excited to be having this conversation because AI continues to be one of the hottest topics in town. So uh, we've got a ton of great content today. We're gonna dive right in. So I want to give you guys kind of first a lay of the land, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we will have Q&A at the end. If you have questions that you wanna ask our presenters, go ahead and type your questions into the chat. Uh, we'll try to cover as many of those questions as possible uh, at the end of the session. Also, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so there will be a link made available if you would like a copy of that. Um, and all of your attendees will be able to receive a copy of this presentation via email once this is done. Um, so if you have e uh, even more questions that you want to ask, you're able to, to circle back to Object Computing, uh, their team, and shoot, shoot over your questions at that time. So let's dive right in, I guess. Uh, like I said, my name's Emily Hemingway. Uh, I'm with Tech STL. I will be your moderator. And then I am joined by a phenomenal group of tech experts at Object Computing. We've got Andy Montgomery, Yachi Chin, and Brandon Lynch. Uh, Andy, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, so it's great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome um, to this great event. Um, I'm excited to be here. I, I know many of you are as well. Um, yeah, so I'm the strategy officer for uh, for object computing. I support the intersection between our growth organization um, and uh, and our and our technology group. So great, thanks, Andy. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Yachi Chen. Uh, Yachi, you are one of our leading experts in the community on AI. Super excited to have you here. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, um, I'm a practitioner and a strategist uh, for my past uh, decades of uh, AI efforts. Um, as a practitioner in my early careers, I have accumulated a lot of uh, uh, this implementation-wise. And uh, as I grow a lot of uh, mature to my career and uh, uh, learned along the strategy side of pitfalls, uh, I really want to share back as our core values at Object Computing. So here I am. Glad to be here. Thanks, Yachi. And then third up, we've got Brandon Lynch. He is a security engineer, especially when we're talking about threats and risks. We've got to better understand the security piece of this com uh, conversation. So tell us about your background, Brandon. Sure. Um, you know, I uh, primarily uh, at Abject Computing looking at uh, security across cloud application security, data security. Uh, threat analysis, risk assessment, stuff like that. And now diving a lot into uh, all the AI risk and security considerations and stuff like that. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Brandon. Okay, so let's cover the agenda for what we're going to be discussing in this webinar. It's only an hour, but you guys have a ton of uh, powerful information. Um, so it's in some ways, it's going to be like a fire hose, but you guys better be taking notes because there's some really incredible uh, topics that will be covered. So first, we're going to look at who is object computing. What I love about you guys is that you are based here in St. Louis. You've been one of the founding members of Tech STL. I love learning more and more about you guys as an organization. And I'm sure everybody on the call is going to be excited about that, too. Then we're going to be exploring the state of AI. We're now uh, a little over a year past when ChatGPT first dropped, and so really exploring where we are now, um, heading into 2024. And then the bulk of what this webinar is going to be covering is addressing the risks and mitigation strategies around the threats, the biases, some of the challenges that we're facing with AI. And then as promised, at the very end, we've got our Q&As. So if you have questions, again, drop them into the chat, and we will hold time at the end to, to visit them. So now let's dive into uh, the introduction to the conversation. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Andy um, to be able to kick us off so that we can dive into the content. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, for those of you who don't know Object Computing, we are a 30-year consulting business um, here in St. Louis. Um, you know, we've uh, we have staff across across the country um, and around the world. Um, but we really focus on open systems, open solutions across software engineering cloud architecture, cloud engineering, AI and ML, uh, digital ledger technologies, and, and embedded systems. 
Um, you know, we we support multiple uh, public and private organizations uh, across multiple industries, uh, everything from aerospace to, to transportation in the rail uh, rail industry to healthcare and um, and beyond. Um, so super excited to unpack uh, some of the offerings we have here today around AI and ML um, with you. Um, how do we do all that? Um, well, we we really focus on um, helping build uh, build applications, building solutions, uh, modernizing application ecosystems, um, be it in large enterprises or or mid -size business businesses. Um, we bring consultancies around AI and ML to help you uncover uh, that data insight um, for decision makers. And ultimately, uh, across those ecosystems, we also bring can bring embedded engineers to really drop into your organizations and, and really help sort of execute and uh, and bring to life the pro program. Um, sorry. Great. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, so obviously this has been the year of, of talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, it's been, I didn't know a lot about this before ChatGPT came out and with the role in Tech STL, and this is the thing that everybody wants to talk about, I've had to learn a heck of a lot more. Uh, we've been hosting a three-part series all on the enterprise integration of AI, and it's really helped kind of unearth some of these big questions. In this specific webinar, we're going to be exploring the generative AI piece. And I'm curious, Andy, if you can really explain how is Gen AI and AI different? What is the specific value that Gen AI brings? And also, what are the biggest risks that we're looking at for that angle of this conversation? Yeah, I mean, Emily, we, we've seen um, all sorts of, of changes and transformations over the last uh, last year or so. Um, you know, large language models aren't necessarily new, but what I think we've seen is this uh, this 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 shift in how they can be applied. Right, we've all saw um, the apps that came out, the 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 image creation. Take a photo of me, make me look like my dad. You know, 30, 40 years from now, that generative element of taking something and transforming it, or creating something from nothing. Um, you know, from a description of a words that 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 I can provide. Um, the reality is, enterprises are. Uh, are, are taking that to an all new level. And as you said, the, 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 the launch of, 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 of um, chat GPT and the various different iterations that have come from that, from all the different environments, different cloud providers are only just continuing to sort of throw that uh, sort of off the chart. But as we sit back and look at our enterprise, we talk to our partners, we listen to customers, um, we see generative AI really really embracing um, the, the communities at large in really four key areas. And all of that is tied around how they're transforming the end user, the customer, the consumer's experience. And so it goes without sort of, as you imagine, generative AI can generate great text. It can start to create great conversations. It can provide uh, an environment of interaction that uh, that is more human-like uh, than ever before. And so customer operations, be it through a phone system, through be it through chat environments, um, those are just some of the, the early ways that we're going to continue to see generative AI be able to pull information together and really create an experience that didn't exist before or felt definitely less human-like. Um, personalizing the, the selling to one in a marketing and sales organization. We're going to continue to see generative AI be able to understand the kinds of things you're looking for and bring recommendations along with information. Uh, we learned a lot about how that's happening in healthcare uh, recently, and we're going to continue to see that uh, that kind of marketing conversation really continue to, to unfold. Um, for those of you who are in tech or are in IT and, and you're building solutions, You've probably already seen what um, what Microsoft's doing, um, what other groups are doing around generating code, bringing solutions to market faster, com self-completing um, solutions, or even just describing um, what kind of solution you want written in it throws out all the software you need to start with. Uh, we all continue to see that in, in soft software tools. And then research and development. We're going to continue to see organizations find new ways to generate content be it visual, be it text, be it voice, um, in ways we've never thought of before. And so those those will continue to drive 
um, I think the investment um, uh, across industries going forward. Um, additionally, you know, you know, as as McKenzie has sort of helped us sort of articulate in some of its most recent research, um, we see organizations going like gangbusters in this direction. Um, most respondents, you know, a third of the respondents are saying they're already using it. Uh, Forty percent are saying they're going to increase the the investment that they're making in this space. Um, but I think what's really connected to why this conversation today is so important is that, you know, half of those organizations are not paying enough attention to the risks that they're getting into. They, they haven't looked far enough ahead yet to understand what they have to plan for. And so I'm super excited uh, to hear Yachi and Brandon share really the risks and the strategies for managing those risks um, as we look to that future. So Emily, with that, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, so did you cover this slide, the Gen AI, Gen AI risks? No, is this, is this handed over to you or is this going over to Yachi? It's going to Yachi. Ah, okay. Sorry. The notes were a little confusing. Okay. So then Yachi, I'm going to kick this over to you. Can you explain what these, uh, Gen AI risks are and how we're going to be diving more deeply into it for the webinar? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily. Um, so these are the common risks uh, that we have seen our customer are facing and uh, uh, we cast into four broader categories. Uh, we're going to use the next uh, 20 minutes-ish to dive deep into each uh, buckets and each category. And then we're going to have um, we're going to have the uh, mitigation strategies, uh, strategies, you know, calling the, the risk is, is a first step. Uh, recognizing that and mitigating that is we definitely want you, every one of you to walk away with. Um, so uh, from just the high level uh, uh, pressure tests, are, are these the common, um, just judging by the name, uh, please give me a hands up if uh, this is some uh, some at least one of those uh, challenges hit, hits you as a, as a user of Gen AI. Can I see the response from the audience really quick? Um, thank you. Thank you for some of you um, already show your hands up. Uh, that uh, basically means you're going to walk away with um, you are going to walk away with some very practical um, risks in, in there. Uh, so let's dive into the next one. So this one, in effective queries and the hallucinations are one of the top outstanding challenges as a regular users ourselves. When we interact with Gen AI uh, software applications, we often find that when we want to ask some questions, it takes me a few iterations to kind of get to the exactly answer I want. And uh, not every question is going to be as simple as the one I'm showing on the, uh, on the top right uh, corner of that uh, straight line. It takes iterations. And that kind of iteration is um, sometimes is, is ne necessary. Um, and then hallucinations is definitely another outstanding thing that very, it, it was born with the Gen AI applications. I, I was, uh, so you can see the bottom right corner, I, I sent uh, ChatGPT, can I trust you? Even ChatGPT uh, clarified that I'm not everything I said is true. So I uh, just want to make sure that we are aware, we acknowledge the, the app can provide similarly factual information. This is all based on um, the statistics and all the data um, the model is trained on. So I'm going to unpack uh, the mitigation strategy in the next slide. So the first one you probably heard a lot as well. I want to, it doesn't hurt for me to reiterate is um, really adopt a lot of best practice. You might heard the word um, prompt engineering. I, I don't I don't think you have to follow uh, the exact uh, configuration, but the gist of it is really to providing context and using the descriptive la language. And at the bottom line, you want to avoid ambiguity. You, you look at your, your question and try to ask yourself, there are, are there other alternative way to interpret uh, that kind of query. So, so these are the, 
uh, the the common best practice you want to take, and that's fairly easy, right? It's instead of going to prompt engineer uh, where you have to uh, follow very specific uh, formats, uh, which you can, um, but it probably uh, add a little bit technical barrier for uh, a regular user to conveniently use uh, this tool. Next one. Human in the loop is not really a new concept. For those of you who are familiar in the AI industry, human in the loop was invented the day uh, AI was invented. It's, it's, AI was never really invented to replace uh, human, and we always use human as a way to guard, to be the guardrail, to making sure it's doing the right thing. And that's especially true for Gen AI applications, where it's actually more important in this kind of context where you want to uh, add this new and relevant quality checks and the verification process to make sure your SME, your experts are able to be um, involved in this process. E either it, that is in the process of sum up or sum down, or it's a ranking process is I like uh, certain answers better than the others. It will help you um, to... Uh, making sure the, it gives the answer you wanted. Next. These are also not new when we think about the different level of quality checks. And I was talking about a uh, customer from healthcare and customer from uh, a relatively uh, like gaming and more entertainment industry. They have different views of how quality checks works uh, in their respective business. For high stake business, you might want to have very strict uh, level of check while well, for entertainment where your your risk can be just uh, uh, have some the users frown upon are certain um, unprecise uh, answers. So, so this, this uh, being aware of this levels of quality checks is uh, is a uh, is going to give you the right balance of uh, efforts and uh, the return on investment. So the last one um, is some some something you started to see for uh, applications like Bing, where it actually cites you the data sources, and that's uh, something to. Uh, really confirm it comes from the factual uh, sources, then um, Gen AI um, makes it up by, by itself. Uh, this is a good practice when think about a service provider to provide the answers to the users and how you make sure you're not really uh, spitting out some gibberish uh, uh, answers based on unrealistic uh, data. So that's all uh, from this bucket. I'll turn it over to Emily. Great, thanks. Well, and so this is, as someone who's also really trying to learn how to navigate Gen AI, I mean, all of Gen AI, I keep calling Gen AI, Gen AI, it's all really helpful for me to better understand what this looks like. And so you've talked a little bit about how regular users are able to be a little bit more successful in interacting with this technology, but the whole theme of today is looking at how LLM models and how this technology can be used by people who have potentially a malicious intent, um, that there are threat threats to this. So Brandon, we're going to turn it over to you. Can you talk a little bit more around where there are risks uh, involved with this Gen AI tool? Yes, of course. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so one of the first things that I would be thinking about is protecting against model poisoning or training data poisoning attacks. So this can happen when the data that you use to train your Gen AI model with is, is tampered with. So as an example, if you look at the diagram, let's say we have a Gen AI app designed to act as like a financial advisor, right? And you have a, a threat actor who intentionally poisons the sample documents with falsified tax laws. The model then trains on this bad data which leads to users unintentionally committing tax fraud. And that's obviously a pretty bad outcome. So ultimately, you know, a model poisoning attack can result in inaccurate or disinformation, performance degradations, reputational damage, and backdoors. And so for backdoors, like I said, they're, they're typically created through uh, model poisoning. And so in this case, someone will go ahead and poison the training data with a specific trigger word. 
And once the trigger word is injected into the prompt, the model will perform the adversary's desired outcomes. And so this can be used, for example, to steal sensitive information that the model may have access to. Um, okay, so let's touch on model evasion attacks specifically through the lens of prompt injection. Um, so not only is prompt injection one of the most serious vulnerabilities in large language models, but it's also one of the most common. Uh, prompt injection can occur in two ways. You have direct, which directly overwrites a system prompt, or indirectly, in which the model manipulates inputs from external sources, like an uploaded document uh, or parses a website. Uh, as an example of a direct prompt injection, this was uh, discovered in ChatGPT, and it's called the grandma jailbreak or grandma exploit. And this basically allowed users to bypass certain moral, ethical, and safety restrictions programmed in the ChatGPT by simply sending it a specialized prompt. Um, so we've kind of went through uh, some of these model security risks. Let's look at how we can start to mitigate them. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, you know, ensuring the confidentiality and, and integrity of both your training data and the model itself is key to mitigating these attacks. In terms of maintaining confidentiality, you know, this is really no different than protecting against any type of data. You want to make sure that you're encrypting your data at rest and in transit, making sure you follow the principle of least privilege when assigning access to data. Uh, but you know, we're going to talk more about data privacy and security a bit later on. Now, in terms of maintaining integrity, authenticity, and safety of your data and model, as well as reducing supply chain attacks, there's a lot we can do. Uh, you know, the first thing that we have to do, even before you receive or gather your data used to train the model, is to carefully assess your data sources and suppliers, making sure to thoroughly read through, you know, their privacy policies and terms and conditions and, and stuff like that. Uh, essentially, you only want to use trusted suppliers for your training data. Another major aspect in your mitigation strategy should be creating an accurate, up-to-date, and signed inventory of all of your application components. And this is also known as a software bill of material or SBOM. Now, this is an area that a lot of people may gloss over, but it's so, so important. Um, according to the Linux Foundation, the survey participants revealed their top benefits for producing SBOMs. So 51% said that it's easier for developers to understand their dependencies across components in an app. 49% said that it's easier to monitor components for vulnerabilities. 44% said it's easier to manage license compliance. So there's tons and tons of benefits for creating and using SBOMs, including, like I said, identifying and remediating known vulnerabilities, but also verifying that components have not been tampered with or maintaining their integrity and verifying the authenticity of software components. So, you know, this is absolutely necessary for reducing supply chain risk for any application, but especially for LLM apps where you need to track the integrity of authenticity of your data and, and uh, model as well. Um, so, you know, you can also use your SBOM to continuously monitor for vulnerabilities. By monitoring your SBOM, you can be alerted for new zero day vulnerabilities and be able to address them quickly, right? And, you know, monitoring is important for any app, but for LLMs, you need to know what types of things that you would want to monitor for. For example, you should be monitoring your LLM's input and output to make sure that it, it is what you expect, right? Uh, this by itself can help you detect certain security flaws like prompt injection, like uh, insecure output handling and sensitive information disclosure. All right, so let's touch on explainable AI or XAI. So... Explainable AI addresses the challenge of understanding how and why a machine learning model makes their predictions. Because if you can't trust why an LLM uh, made a certain decision, then you're you're much you're much less likely to trust it. So by implementing different model explainability techniques, we can sort of bridge the gap between the complex calculations that a model may make and human understanding to create uh, some trust. And lastly, I will touch on adversarial training, which is one of the best and most common ways that you can mitigate against any type of adversarial attack in LLMs like prompt injection. So by exposing your model to both good and bad examples, 
They can force the model to distinguish between a legitimate request and a malicious one. And this is a great way to increase the robustness and safety of your model. Um, so yeah, these were some of the ways that you can mitigate model security and explainability risks like model poisoning, backdoors, and prompt injection. Thanks, Brandon. Well, and I feel like, especially now going into 2024, the topic of conversation that we're continually having to facilitate in the community is around security, the risks, the vulnerabilities. I'm glad to see that we have, um, you know, some great organizations that are really leading that conversation. So thank you guys for that. Um, what's also been exciting is that as AI has continued to really take shape, shape, we've seen a lot of organizations that are really jumping in with object computing as one of them and building out these customized gen AI applications to really serve their customers. But that customer data piece has to be one of the biggest concerns that we have when we talk about security risks. Um, Yachi, can you talk a little bit more around how you guys are addressing those, those concerns around customer data and maybe some best practices that you guys have seen in the industry? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you're absolutely right, Emily. Um, customer data could be really at high risk um, in terms of uh, general application build on top of it. Um, as a service provider ourselves and as a data scientist myself, I understand that for a lot of uh, customer in the industry, um, they really see data as their moat. They see data as their IP, as their competitive edge. And we are very aware of that. So we, we, we really believe data is one of the most important area of, of the organization and uh, the, the treatment deserves a good uh, standard coverage. So there's definitely a lot of uh, aspect to consider when we consider data security. Uh, if you see the flywheel, there, there's a lot of potential uh, problem associated with, with data security and uh, privacy. Uh, and in general application, given the size of the data, it's big data is already at a, a table stake. And uh, um, every general model is trained really beyond the, a bigger data, right? It's, uh, it's no doubt that it's even harder with the complexity and volumes of the data increases. Uh, it's, it's getting harder to um, making sure every, each of this is, uh, is safely guarded. Uh, the good news is we do have good strategy to, to cover it. So if you go to the next slide, here are four broader um, aspects you want to make sure uh, to guard your data security and privacy. So data minimization, what does that mean? It means, it, it means for a lot of people, it means that uh, I only, you want to make sure only the people who need to see the data can see the data. Only the people who uh, can um, download the data can download the data. So um, that's that's partially right. It's also for for a lot of organizations. It also means uh, it's not only means uh, what data needs to be accessed, but also how long. So that time period is also critical for a lot of uh, people. You might heard a lot of healthcare data only needs to be in certain developer um, uh, environment for, for certain period of time. It's, it's, it's really one of the practice you, you want to make sure your organization follows. That data minimization really makes sure that uh, to minimize the, the access and to uh, making sure the, the, the only the right people are able to um, to access that data. Data anonymization is, uh, is not really new, um, especially for a lot of high stake industries like healthcare, FinTech, um, those, data, uh, those data are likely containing a lot of PI information. Uh, for a lot of um, uh, data in this space, you don't really need a lot of those sensitive information in a lot, in a lot of cases to build models, right? But it probably takes a long, uh, a bigger efforts to uh, remove it than to um, anonymize it. So you can mask the data, for example, uh, when you have social security number or people's date of birth, where you can you can reverse to make sure you can, you are able to get the individual information. So what you want to do is to mask it. You can randomize the social security number. It's still um, uh, persist the same format, so it doesn't really interact or contaminate your your 
data schema and all your all your pipelines, but it it doesn't really uh, give you the exact traceability to to uh, to identify the individual. So that's another good practice you you want to follow. Data encryption um, is has, has been adopted in a broader AI space for years, and it, I want to reiterate that you really want to encrypt data at rest and in transit to protect it from the potential breaches and unauthorized access. There are a lot of standard protocols associated uh, in this space, and you, you really want to make sure you follow that. Um, the, the last thing is the uh, uh, access control. Access control, I, I was a little, in a little bit at the beginning part of the data minimization. Access control covers uh, a uh, different read, write, uh, move, all those different practices. And it has different levels and different uh, scope. And you can get as granulate as, as you want. And you want to do that uh, for a lot of high uh, stake and sensitive data. Um, so that's the general four different uh, paths and aspects you want to follow uh, to protect your data security and privacy. Turning back to you, Emily. Great. Well, so I'm glad that industry leaders and that area companies and experts are, are really putting in the guardrails. Uh, I think the other piece of this conversation that we're now able to talk about is that AI is also now triggering this larger federal compliance and regulatory conversation. Um, recently, uh, CISA, in response to the, the White House executive order around the usage of AI, put out the AI roadmap, and that's really triggered a lot of more federal conversation around compliance uh, and regulatory issues. Um, Brandon, can you talk to us a little bit more around what that landscape is now looking like, both on a federal level as well as it's, how it's implemented um, within the businesses themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the first thing I'll mention in terms of uh, the regulatory and compliance landscape is that uh, any of the guidelines that you would normally follow in your industry or organization can still apply to your Gen AI applications. But it is very interesting right now, and it can honestly be a bit confusing in terms of AI-specific regulation. Um, and since Gen AI is, is so new right now, it can be a bit unclear what, if any, regulations that you may need to adhere to. The other thing that you may need to worry about is if um, there may be regulations or compliance standards, some across multiple jurisdictions that you need to adhere to in the future, but that may not even exist yet, right? So. What's the best way to prepare yourself for that? And that's what we'll get into on in the next slide. So, you know, there's a few things you can do. Of course, the best way to position yourself for success in terms of AI compliance and regulation is first by simply staying up to date with all of the latest regulations. Um, for example, you mentioned the uh, executive order that was signed on uh, in October of 2023. You also have states like California and Illinois creating laws to require businesses to be more transparent about AI systems. And there's tons of other states right now <clears throat> working on AI regulations that cover tons of different topics across data privacy, accountability, et cetera. Um, the other thing you can be thinking about is utilizing AI frameworks and standards. And while there aren't many out there right now, you do have a couple of good ones. For example, uh, NIST has released their AI Risk Management Framework, or RMF. And this is similar to the regular RMF, but it's specifically tailored to AI. And it was designed to improve the ability to incorporate trustworthiness considerations into your design, development, use of AI systems and services. Um, and as you can see in the graphic, you know it's split into four functions. The base of the framework is Govern, which establishes the systems and processes necessary for AI risk management. Then you have map, the map function, which establishes the context of risk in AI systems. You have the measure function, which uh, analyzes and assesses and monitors AI risk. And then lastly, the manage function, which establishes the controls needed to maintain your AI risk management uh, system. So this is definitely a great one to check out and it's, it's just free and, and available publicly. So whether you're creating AI products uh, or even just using them across your organization, it's it's a good one to check out. Um, so that sort of covers the AI and compliance landscape at a high level, as well as the things that you should be doing to prepare for more regulations to come. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. So 
as promised, we've covered a lot of content, right? So this is the original slide that had the four topic areas that you were looking at. Here's all the different mitigation strategies that you guys have shared up until now. Yachi, can you dive a little bit deeper in what your thoughts are around how organizations can really take this work to the next level? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, we indeed, we cover a lot. There's a lot of screenshots or note taking, but don't worry, we're going to share this back to everyone here. Um, there's a, a definitely a lot of experience spoken here and a lot of very pragmatic uh, thing you can adopt either as a user or as a um, a service provider uh, or as the uh, uh, organization who want to get more transparency in what's exactly behind the scene uh, in terms of the model security explainability because those foundation models were created by a big cloud vendors and they were not necessarily going to give you that level of transparency that uh, you want. So have the right techniques to serve uh, your organization and your clients to make sure they, they have the right level of understanding of what the model does behind the scenes is super critical. Um, and from a um, individual user perspective, we have tons of great uh, uh, query and uh, avoidance uh, to those hallucination strategies you can quickly adopt. It's, uh, it's not going to be as sophisticated as a lot of those uh, rigorous um, Prompt engineer, but prompt engineering's, uh, but they are very easy to adopt, and it will save you a lot of efforts and time um, to make your work more productive. And uh, as a as a service provider ourselves, or or, 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 or some of you who want to provide those uh, customer. Uh, general application to your clients, this data security and privacy um, strategy hopefully will give you that level of confidence to make sure you're protecting people's uh, um, data privacy. Their this is their moat, their competitive edge, their IP. That's absolutely needs to be guarded uh, in the right way. And uh, Brandon shared a lot of uh, very handy material that are. Um, free to uh, to walk away and then you can refer when you need them. A lot of those are can be very detailed and you can um, quickly search for some keyword. I think I would suggest a lot of these bullets can be used as keyword when you are trying to making sure uh, or you're not sure that if you are um, in compliance with the policy, use those keywords to to kind of pinpoint the the those detailed documents and see if uh, if that's the case. Um, so with that, if you go to next slides, um, to directly address Emily's question. So um, for if you are like me, really excited by these uh, Gen AI possibilities this year, um, these are the areas we really uh, recommend you to research as you speak to your service provider. If you are ambitious and you really want to move your business to, to the next level by harnessing Gen AI in the right way, you want to make sure you're, part, you're finding the partners uh, that can address the concerns in these different, uh, different uh, buckets. Uh, I want to make sure people understand the defense in depth framework because we are talking about a lot of um, uh, supervision or checks and the verification, right? This defense in depth framework basically is a holistic way to make sure you have different level of coverage because there's, uh, you cannot uh, pay um, more attention to these things. These are your, your really critical parts of your, your, your IP and your competitive edge. So really uh, good, uh, want to give some advice to, to people here uh, who's trying to uh, thrive uh, in, in the new era of Gen AI. With that, um, I can turn over to Emily. All right, so like I said, we are gonna open it up to, to Q&A. Um, so if you've got some burning questions, drop them in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the first one. Uh, what specific encryption protocols and measures do you recommend for ensuring data security and privacy in Gen AI applications? Who wants to take that one on? Brendan, you want to do it? You want me to take a shot at? Uh, I can talk like, more. Sure. Yeah, to... I'd, I'd, I'd be glad to answer. So. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I mean, you have you have tons of of industry standard uh, and accepted protocols. So 
for encrypting data at rest, um, probably something like AES would be the best way to go, right? And then when you're encrypting data in transit, using an up-to-date uh, TLS protocol with uh, up-to-date Cypher suites and stuff like that. Um, that's that's really all you need for the most part in terms of encrypting at rest and in transit. Great, thank you, Brandon. All right, next question. Can you provide examples of how organizations secure training data to prevent model poisoning and backdoor attacks in Gen AI models? Sure, I can answer that one as well. Um, so like I was saying, there's there's tons we do. And, and basically everything that uh, Yachi was covering in terms of data privacy and security, doing those things are really gonna help uh, prevent specifically model poisoning and backdoor attacks. So minimizing uh, the data that you collect, maintaining strict access control, making sure that you know people have the minimum necessary permissions to access their data, access is revoked when they no longer need it, and uh, you periodically review access, as well as encrypting data um, and, and that sort of thing. And again, maintaining the integrity, maintaining uh, your, your software build material, if you will, in terms of um, knowing that your data has not been tampered with and knowing the authentic authenticity of the data. That's gonna help make sure to reduce your risk of model poisoning and backdoor attacks. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Aside from risks associated with Gen AI, are there any scalable methodologies to measure what responses are expected versus what responses are truly generated by Gen AI? Yeah, I can take that. Thanks, Monka. Good to see you here again. Um, so um, there are two aspects to consider. Uh, one is actually associated the testing framework. For any application, testing framework is not new. You you did do the, uh, a lot of unit tests, uh, integration tests, uh, regression tests to make sure the, the software, the application uh, operates the way you want it to be. And that's still holds true for any Gen AI application. So from a uh, app developer perspective, you want to make sure your, your testing framework is uh, able to capture all the uh, necessary um, testing cases that are uh, either be organized by the business uh, stakeholders, the rules. So one example I can share you is that we are working with uh, um, uh, clients where they are they are developing they're trying to develop a chatbot and they are trying to making sure the chatbot has the right boundary. Boundary means the chatbot needs to make sure it uh, knows what question to answer and which ones it cannot answer instead of really spitting out the gibberish response, right? Um, so that piece is critical. Like, what are the boundary questions? How do I? How does the general application or chatbot know uh, what? Uh, the what are the list of things I should be able to answer, um, and that's important, and that's largely driven by um, the business and the SMEs in the space. Um, and the the second levels are kind of related to the verification um, pro process, in my opinion, where you want to cite uh, the contacts or the data sources to really verify your your answers are. Uh, are correct. Uh, and one technique, uh, hopefully it was um, familiar by a lot of enthusiasts and practitioners here in the call is, uh, is RAD, Retrieval Augmented Generation, where what you do is you actually um, uh, leverage external um, web websites and data sources, not the ones that your Gen AI model is trained on, but the ones that really out there uh, it's a lot of external and the contextual information to help you retrieve and uh, better configure your your answers. Uh, so we are, I believe we have a blog that elaborates that a little bit more. So stay tuned on that. Um, thanks for the question. It's a good question. Thanks, Yachi. Okay, next up from Mark. It says, I'd like to hear more about explainability. We use AI to analyze documents for fraudulent alterations. As a person, I can explain why a document is fraudulent to a customer. Example, text is misaligned on the page versus what's expected. How can I get a similar explanation from AI? 
Yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying that there are, this area is a very active researching area. Often when people say it's an active researching area, it means it's not mature enough. There's no converged solution. So that, that's a red flag because uh, the, the, the big data in the big data, bigger data space, it's really hard to really understand every single um, data input to understand what exactly down behind the scene. Um, and it's, you probably see a lot of um, um, benchmarking where they rank all the foundation models and rank their transparency. Um, a lot of the, the private uh, models are from those call vendors are fairly uh, closed or um, la lack of transparency. So there are some things you, you really cannot push that far. Luckily, you do have a lot of good ways to um, um, unpack that piece a little bit. One example, uh, not necessarily for text, but for image space is you can actually um, reproject your input image um, from the output uh, from your output of those image to to the uh, to input image space. What I mean by that, you are there's a technique you can use to highlight the region of your input image to show which parts of the image actually helped or contributed to the AI model that makes the AI model believe um, it gives the 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 answer. Uh, why it gives the answer. So there are techniques of that and different uh, variations of that uh, gives a fairly reasonable uh, explainability in the image space. Um, uh, in the in the in the text space, it's a it's a bit it's a bit tricky. Um, you are you are talking about uh, text is aligned on the page versus uh, misaligned on the page versus what's what's expect. The the similar explanation of that is kind of. Um, uh, I think there are different levels of uh, of this uh, in this space. Uh, you one way we have done in the past is you can simplify this AI model with some um, human interpretable inputs. So what I mean by that is often AI model relies on raw input and it does some embedding and uh, representation behind the scene to uh, do whatever decision, right? And that's complicated because that's a gigantic uh, model. Uh, what you can do is you can use a simple human interpretable input to overfit, um, basically to mimic how the model thinks. It's not going to be accurate, but this is for explainability purpose. So, so you, by developing a simpler model, like a tree-based model, random forest or decision tree, you can perturb the input in a way that help you to explain certain human interpretable uh, inputs is going to have impact on your on your um, on your output. So in your case, if you know something like the misalignment or there are other attributes that you believe are part of the consideration of why AI is making the solution, you can build a very simple model to use those as input and build a simple decision tree model to, to try to understand better of your, um, of your complicated AI model. This is a very commonly used, but it's easier said than done because you need to have a very good understanding on your, what are the critical human interpretable inputs are, because some of them might not be that be obvious. So it requires a continuous uh, explanation, uh, collaboration between you and your service provider. It's a really, really good question. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Yachi. That was a really, really great answer. Okay, so next question. What are the essential components of a defense in-depth framework when it comes to Gen AI and how are these layers structured? I think I can answer that one. All right, Brandon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of defense in-depth for anything, it's, it's all about implementing security controls at every aspect or every layer um, of a system or, or application. So for example, you know, when, if you really want to have a robust, secure, reliable, uh, AI platform, you can't just say that you're going to secure, you know, just the training data, or you're just going to test for uh, prompt injection. You have to look at the, the whole picture and apply security controls at each layer. So 
you would start with your training data, start with before you get your training data, securing the training data, maintaining integrity, um, testing for all of the specific types of, of vulnerabilities, making sure you you do have model explainability, and and again all the different like security aspects that I was mentioning, like uh, you know prompt injection, uh, uh, sensitive information exposure, stuff like that. So essentially, by implementing security controls at all of these different layers, you can implement a defense in depth framework. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so Mark also referenced um, considering knowledge graphs as an option as a way to improve explainability and input to the model. Um, Yachi, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, knowledge graph is a good way. Thanks for your comments, uh, Mark. When we think about graph, we talk about uh, the connectivity, we talk about the relationship, and that relationship, this whole entire graph also has its own um, uh, retrieval augmented, uh, it can serve a way to do your RAC uh, process um, by connecting all the relationship together. There are specific techniques uh, in this broader space. Um, you can bring data from different formats based on its native uh, uh, connectivity. Um, so I'm happy to uh, have a, a deep technical dive with, with Mark on this and love to learn your experience and expertise in the space as well. All right, great. Next question. How do organizations strike a balance between collecting enough data for training Gen AI models and minimizing the risk of data breaches? I will take a stab at this one. So um, if you start with, say, data minimization, which is, you know, you, you want to collect only the minimum amount of data necessary for training your models. If you know the contents of the data and you know that there are extra things in there that you there's, there's no way you would need uh, for training data, then I would start with filtering out all of that stuff first, you know, looking at it and seeing what you absolutely don't need. So that would be the great the great start for collecting just enough data. And then that by itself can help reduce the risk of sensitive break, sensitive data breaches. And then again, reducing the risk of data breaches in general. Um, same thing, same stuff, access control. Um, my mind's blanking right now, but we covered all of them. Access control. Um, that's, that's yeah, if I may, if I may add more comments to that, I'm not sure it's within the scope of this question, but sometimes um, we have seen clients struggle to to figure out what is enough. Um, the good news is for a lot of the foundation model that you have seen in the industry right now, they have been trained uh, to perform a very general task. So the hard part is done. The purpose of you not really need to feed a lot of data to build a bespoke uh, machine learning model um, is that the foundation model has that general capability and all you need to do is do some fine tuning or some one shot few shots so one shot or zero shot one shot or few shots basically means you give the model the foundation model some example how you want what kind of task you want the model to to work on and the model can quickly learn um, how how it works just imagine when you are trying to the different experience when you are trying to teach a, to a toddler to drive versus you try to teach a teenager to drive, um, assuming they haven't really had any kind of uh, car driving experience in the past. Because of the fact that teenager has seen um, adults drive in the past, they have been in the passenger seat, they are actively looking at how it was done, a similar task before, then he or she will pick up the new task very quickly. So think about that, that's the biggest uh, breakthrough, in my opinion, um, how Gen I will um, uh, evolve and uh, really revolutionary, uh, revolutionize our a lot of our very um, expensive bespoke machine learning solutions. Yes, I definitely don't let my toddlers drive. Good point, Yanchi. <laughs> All right, so last question. Um, is anything else that you guys are wanting to ask? 
All right, so we got one more. Are there any guidelines on how to estimate the costs for risk mitigation? Go ahead, Yachi. Yeah, I think this uh, this is uh, is probably uh, the question for um, stakeholders to to decide. Um, one thing which we talk about is the uh, based on your business. Uh, uh, to tolerance like if you're in a high stake business you probably want to factor in more of that uh, cost for for risk mitigation but if you're in a relatively recreational and entertainment industry this this is a like ballpark level of, of estimates so um i will really recommend uh and, and even for when you take a uh, one that uh, one uh, level down for different business problems within your um, uh, bigger business initiative. There are different probably weights associated with those those different initiatives. One thing we have helped our clients to do is to have our quick start um, uh, strategy session. We will rank all the. Um, your basically think about the return on investment perspective. Your different um, initiatives and uh, different uh, smaller goals or portfolios actually they're going to for some of them they're going to share very similar pipeline. They, your data pipeline, your model design pipeline, or even your your risk mitigation. So this is a holistic view of. Uh, to help you understand what what are the best strategies to prioritize your your uh, business use cases and your your missed, uh, uh, mit risk mitigation strategies, so uh, really talk to your your service provider and see if they can offer um, some um, parallel uh, offers like what what we did in the quick start session. Great. Well, thank you guys all so much for sharing that information. Um, I know that there was so much content to run through. Um, so we're really lucky in St. Louis to have a group like Object, Object Computing that's really prioritizing uh, not only the work, but also educating the community. And, and real quick, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. Um, if you have questions, you have follow-ups you want to have, uh, please reach out to Matt. Matt's our director of uh, sales here at Object Computing. He'll be happy to connect you with any of us. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to us on our socials. Um, love to connect with, uh, with all of you and, uh, and learn more about the problems and challenges that you're all facing. Wonderful. And as promised, you guys will get a copy of this slide deck. You'll get emailed from the organizers. So watch your inbox for that. And feel free to circle back with additional questions for the team at OCI. Thanks so much for coming. Everybody stay warm out in this winter weather. Thanks, Thank everyone. you.